I did well in law school, and Edward Levy was then the dean of the law school, and he decided it was time to refurbish the law school's credentials, and it was important to get a clerkship, which we hadn't had in many, many years. Okay. And so he literally camped on Sherman Mitten's doorstep, who was then the assigned to the Seventh Circuit. It was where the, judge, the court he had come up to the Supreme Court from. And um, uh, Mitten agreed to interview me, and I came into Washington and was interviewed. And uh, um, I still don't know how it happened, but I obviously had one of those good days you sometimes have when, when uh, you're being interviewed. And he, he hired me, sent me a handwritten letter saying, I've decided to take you on for next year, be here in August. A, uh, one of Minton's favorite stories was that he went to see Truman um, about when Truman had already indicated they wanted to put him on the court. Mm -hmm. It was in the middle of the World Series and Truman had the set on. He wasn't much of a baseball fan in those days and Minton was a, had played semi-pro ball and uh, the set's on and Minton turns to the president and says, Mr. President, that man up there can hit a homer anytime he's up at bat. And Truman says, oh, that's so. At which point the man hits a homer. <laughs> and Truman says, if you can call him like that on the court, as you can here, you'll be a great justice. <laughs> when I clerked, the, the bright ones were, by and large, the ones who knew how to make the court work the way it should were the ones who'd had legislative experience. Mm -hmm. Hugo Black, I always thought, was an, a really incredibly effective justice. Jackson was almost the exception. He'd never, I don't think he'd ever had any elected experience. He'd been so as attorney Appointed. general, yeah. But which is a pretty broad reaching office and you learn a lot from there, I think. Right. But even so, it was more that he was so, such an elegant wordsmith that made him as successful as he was. He was, we always used to tease, he was the least educated man on the court. He didn't have a law degree. But, uh, and my boss was the most educated. He had an LLM from Yale. But I think there was a general consensus that uh, uh, Justice Jackson could run right rings around uh, Justice Mitten. Earl Warren was, to my mind, a perfect example of a good justice, not because he had these great judicial qualities as such. He had never served as a judge before, and indeed his experiences with the law were kind of dismal. He was the main uh, pusher for the uh, relocation camp, uh, the mm -hmm. Japanese relocation camp policy in California as Attorney General. But he understood the, the, the give and take, the ebb and flow, the how you get people together. Justice Brennan, who never had political experience as such, but grew up in a political family, and I guess you can't, you can't breathe in New Jersey unless you, <laughs> you understand <laughs> politics. But he used to he'd say, what's the first rule of the court? And he'd hold up his hand like that. Five, you gotta get to five to make a difference. There are three kinds of uh, important issues, putting aside Youngstown, which it's fun to go through the earlier uh, reports of what the big cases were coming up. No one mentioned Youngstown as right. an important case. And we didn't think of it as an important case at the time, or at least that's my recollection. I'll see what my colleagues say. But uh, the three important kinds of cases were, there were a lot of the communist cases coming up, uh, the Smith Act and the loyalty oath cases and so on. There were a lot of, of um, civil liberties cases coming up, some in the communist era, but a lot of them in the criminal area as well. And then there were a lot of cases dealing with, with um, for want of a better word, the relationship between states and the federal government, but it wasn't really federalism. It was sort of, they weren't ready to go back to the, to the Van de Vander court days of saying that the Congress can't do anything. But on the other hand, they were, for the first time since the New Deal, looking at some of these cases, like Youngstown and others, and saying, well, even though Congress is the first branch, there are limits on what they can do and what they can't do, and that at least was one of the struggles. Minton was not doctrinaire on any of that. He was pretty good on civil rights. He wasn't much on civil liberties. He wasn't at all sensitive to what the communist cases were, were portending for the First Amendment. He was pretty good on the federalism, or the semi-quasi-federalism cases that were coming up because he, he saw things from the congressional point of view. It was heard for the first time, as you know, in 51. Some of us as law clerks thought of it as an important case. It was getting some attention in academia, but not that much nationally. And I still remember, 
again, I hope my clerks back, my colleagues back up my memory. We used to invite justices down for lunch, and we invited Justice Frankfurter down one time. This was late in May, just about this time of the year, and it's clear they'd already argued the case. Uh, it was then a North Carolina case, I don't remember the name of it, but it was basically Brown versus Ward, and no opinions were circulating, so it's clear they weren't going to come down with the case that year. This was 19, May 1952. And one of the clerks had the temerity to ask him, uh, Justice Frankfurter, why aren't we doing anything about the school case? And he looked at us, uh, all these wet behind the ear male law clerks, and said, why, young man, don't you realize this is a social revolution that we're talking about? Do you want us to bring it down in an election year? And we gasped, and poor Frankfurt, one of Frankfurter's clerks was Abe Chase. I think he was looking for a hole to fall through on the floor. Mm -hmm. And the clerk persisted and said, well, what does that have to do with it? And, and Frankfurter was very explicit. He said, here it is, we're in the middle of a, of a hot election, and we come down with that decision. It's going to literally just divide the country. The, re the Republican candidate is going to come out against it. The Democratic candidate will come out for it. Neither one will have read the opinion. Is that the way you want this important decision to be brought into the public arena? Well, it was Stevenson running against Eisenhower. I'd like to think that Stevenson might have read the opinion. Uh, I don't <laughs> think Eisenhower ever did. And he certainly was against it. He expressed his views against mm -hmm. it uh, quite uh, vocal. I remember. Two things, particularly Douglas, who um, office right next door to Minton, we were on the same time track. So that every morning, as I was coming in, walking to my my clerk's office, he would be on his way to the chambers, and I'd say, "Good morning, Mr. Justice." And straight ahead, not a word, not hello, not a nod, anything. Many years later, when I was in Congress, and uh, another congressman and I were trying to save his hide when uh, Congressman Ford was trying to get him impeached. Um, he was then married to Kathy Douglas, who was a wonderful woman, and she invited us over for dinner one night. And this was, I think, just before his stroke. But, oh, he couldn't have been more charming. He, and I kept thinking, that's not an SOB. <laughs> wouldn't, he, wouldn't even nod at me when I was a clerk. <laughs> now, all buddy-buddy. The other incident I remember is that one time the clerk who was in charge of the invitations invited Black and Douglas down at the same, to the same lunch. and. Um, Black frequently ate in the cafeteria with his clerks. You know, they, he'd sit with them, whereas Black always ate upstairs in the, in the justice's dining room. And when we came in, Black had gone through the line with his clerks and the rest of us, and we were all gathered around the Black, chattering with him and chatting with him. And we walk in, and there's Douglas being served by his messenger who had brought his food down from upstairs. And Black grinned and said, well, Bill, how's the man of the people today? <laughs> <laughs> Jackson was considered, I think that the other justices, and this may be uh, hindsight, and maybe thinking back about how significant that, uh, that concurring opinion was in Youngstown, I just seem to remember that I had the feeling even then that Jackson was was held very much in awe by the other ju ju justices, that he, he seemed to be able to handle the job so much more facilely than they did. I certainly felt that way. I certainly thought that Mil Minton felt that way. For two things. One was that this was an indication of the personal disloyalty of Burton and, and uh, Clark, and that this was a personal defeat for, for the president, not a, didn't have that much to do with government. And the other was that, that the, I don't know if you've heard this before, but the great controversial line in, in Vincent's dissent, which Howard Trinans had crafted, was, there are no absolutes. And that evoked a time editorial and all kinds of, you know, all the ministers got involved. You know, what are you saying, there are no, no absolutes? Are you saying there's no God? <laughs> and all kinds of things like that. And no one, again, I didn't focus, and I don't remember any current, I used to read a lot more law reviews then than I do now, I don't remember any current comment on the real significance of Jackson's mm -hmm. opinion at the time. There isn't much. I mean, I've I didn't think there it, was. There I much. didn't think there was. Because again, you appreciate how, how prescient he was and how, right. how important it was when you start to to look at the, the War Powers Act and some of the other things that we've been struggling with on these right. last 50 some odd.